We left off in the last video at this initial allocation point. Smith has three apples and one banana, and Jones has two apples and three bananas. Now, we suppose they start talking with each other. And the question is, what kind of scope are, is there for voluntary trades? Smith will veto any trade that gets him less than his original amount of utility. So this is his original amount of utility, u naught for Smith. Then anything less than that, anything below that indifference curve is going to be vetoed. So the only possible areas that Smith would agree to would be the, air, the areas over here that give him more utility. Jones has an additional indifference curve like this, u not for Jones. Similarly, he's going to veto any allocation, any new allocation that's going to give him less than his original level of utility. So he's going to insist on the new area being somewhere along here. In looking at the broad scope of things, their desires conflict because Jones wants to go in this direction and Smith wants to go in this direction. However, there is an area where their interests overlap. Roughly here, in this lens-shaped area, Both of them would agree because th that area actually benefits both of them. It increases both their utilities. For a Smith, that area is above and to the right of his initial, initial indifference curve. And for Jones, the area is below and to the left of his initial indifference curve. So what we predict is that they are going to end up, if they, start, if they talk to each other, then they're going to end up making an agreement that's somewhere in that lens-shaped area, in the blue area. Now, we don't know where it's going to be, but suppose it's, um, maybe suppose it's right here. Okay, now that's just an arbitrarily chosen point. So then the question is, well, so this, is, so this initial point is A, let's say this new point is B. The question is, is everything going to end up at B? Is that where it is going to end, or might there be further gains from trade possible. So I'm going to erase the marks that I have right here and then address that question. So we assume that the, the two agents are now at point B. And we wonder whether if they keep on talking they might move to yet another point. So let's draw the indifference curve of Smith that goes through point B and then we'll draw the indifference curve of Jones that goes through point B. So the difference curve of Smith that goes through point B looks something like this. And the difference curve of Jones that goes through point B looks something like this. In order to so we'll call this U1 of Smith and U1 of Jones, if they're going to agree to yet another point, it's going to have to make both Smith and Jones better off. Smith is better off if you go in this direction. Jones is better off if you go in this direction. There is an area that makes them actually both better off. That's this area here. So there are still gains from trade possible. There's still a possibility that um, that both of them, well, there's not a possibility. They will be made better off. Both of them will be made strictly better off if they agree to go to some place like here. Let's call that point, point C.
because as you can see that makes them both better off. So let me erase the marks I've drawn, then ask the question, well, does this keep on going forever? When does it end? When are they not going to be made better off by, by trade? Let me sketch on the lower right a situation where they can't be made better off by trade. Suppose this is the allocate, and I'm not going to draw the whole Edgeworth box, but pretend this is inside an Edgeworth box, and this dot is, is where they are. And suppose that Smith's indifference curve looks like this, and Jones's indifference curve is tangent to Smith's. Okay, so Smith wants to go this way. Jones wants to go this way. Those are unalterably opposed directions. Because the two indifference curves are tangent to each other, there is no lens-shaped area of the kind that we, we had before. And so once you get to a point like this, you're stuck. They can talk forever, but there's no way, there's no way that they're ever going to uh, agree on any on any trade. Again, S Smith wants to go here, and Jones wants to go here, and those areas only touch at the one point where they already are at. So in order to, what we're going to assume is that they keep on talking until they get to a point like that. And once I get to a point like that, then all talking stops because all the gains from trade are exhausted. And therefore, what we're going to assume is that they finish their negotiation at a point where Smith's indifference curve and Jones's indifference curve are tangent to each other. Maybe C is a point like that, or maybe C is not a point like that. So Suppose it is. Suppose C is a point like that. Well, I can draw Smith's indifference curve through C and Jones's indifference curve through C. Do that a little bit better. And so C is a tangency point, and that's going to be where they remain. Let me erase some of the other marks here so you can see that more clearly. So here I've drawn an indifference curve for Smith. That has this end. And an indifference curve for Jones. That is this end. And you can see that they're tangent at point C. Every indifference curve for Smith, like the ones I have at the bottom left, is going to have some indifference curve for Jones that's tangent to it. For example, this or this. And the points of tangency here and here would be points where, in some other situation, they might end up agreeing to stay. Similarly, if every indifference curve for Jones, like the ones I have on the upper right, is tangent to some indifference curve for Smith. The points of tangency like this and this. We can draw a few more points like that. Some Smith's indifference curves and the corresponding indifference curves for Jones tangent, and again I'm going to put point C as one of them, and it's useful to connect these dots. They'll actually go to the corners. This green line that I've drawn has a name. It's called the contract curve. It's called a contract curve because we assume that if Smith and Jones talk to each other long enough, they'll end up somewhere on the contract curve. They will exhaust all the possibilities for gains from trade for making each other better off, and they'll end up somewhere there. 
Let's revisit the initial situation with Smith and Jones. So they're at point A in the beginning. And now that we have the contract curve, what we can say is that our prediction is that Smith and Jones will end up somewhere on the contract curve between this point and this point. Let me call this point Y and this one Z. If they went from A to Y, Smith won't veto that because he's indifferent between A and Y. But what that would mean is that Jones would capture all the gains from trade. Jones's original indifference curve is this one. And his new indifference curve is the one that's tangent to y. So he would be the big winner if they ended up going from a to y. But it's a possibility if he's a really good bargainer. They could also start out from a and go to z. In that case, Smith would be the big winner. Because Smith's original indifference curve is this, and his new indifference curve would be that. So he'd gain a lot. And Jones would be on the same indifference curve at Z that he started out with at A. So while he wouldn't veto a move from A to Z, it wouldn't benefit him at all. So those are possibilities. And if one of them is a really good bargainer and the other one isn't, you might, end, you might go from A to Y or A to Z. Probably you don't. Probably you go somewhere between Y and Z on the green line on the contract curve, a point like C. If you're starting out at point A, of course there are lots of parts of the contract curve that are irrelevant. All the points like this or like this are going to be irrelevant because they'll be vetoed by one of the agents or the other. So you know you're going to have to be in between Y and Z on the contract curve. Finally, direct your attention to the typewritten definitions that I have on the right hand side of the screen. The first one, which is a little hard to understand, and that's why I wrote the second one. The first one defines the term Pareto optimal. This is named after the early 20th century economist, Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto. And it says an allocation is Pareto optimal if it is impossible to make one person better off without making another person worse off. Now, it's hard to understand a definition that's phrased uh, with the word impossible in it. So it's a little bit easier to understand the negation of Pareto optimal, which is right here. That says an allocation is not Pareto optimal if it is possible to make one person better off without making another person worse off. Economists, neoclassical economists, believe that allocations which are not Pareto optimal are pretty bad. Because if you're in such an allocation, an allocation that's not Pareto optimal, you could do something else that wouldn't hurt anybody and would help some people. We call allocations that are not Pareto optimal inefficient. Let me type that. So in the bottom right now, I've typed that, an, that the term inefficient in economic theory means not Pareto optimal. And since the only kind of optimality economists usually talk about is Pareto optimality, often instead of just saying instead of saying it's not Pareto optimal, we just say it's not optimal. Similarly, the term efficient in economics means it is Pareto optimal, and we call that optimal. So when an economist says something is inefficient, technically what he means is it's not Pareto optimal. And when he says it's efficient, then he means it is Pareto optimal. Now let's look at the Edgeworth box from the point of view of Pareto optimality. A point like A is inefficient because you can move from A to someplace else like B or C and make both people better off. B was also inefficient because although people were happier than they were at A, you could still move from B to C and make them both better off.
point C was an efficient point. Because if you're a point C, there's no way to make Smith better off without making Jones worse, and there's no way to make Jones better off without making Smith, Smith worse. So C is an optimal point. It's a Pareto optimal point. Sometimes instead of using the word Pareto optimal, we say Pareto efficient. So Pareto efficient and Pareto optimal means exactly the same thing. I claim that the contract curve is the set of Pareto optimal points in the Edgeworth box. The contract curve. is the set of Pareto optimal points of the Edgeworth box. Because it's the set of all points where you have tangencies between Smith's and Jones's indifference curves, and that means that their interests are diametrically opposed. You can't make one better off without making the other one worse off. Now, one has to be careful not to interpret words like optimal too literally. All the points on the contract curve are Pareto optimal, which means they're optimal, they're efficient. One of the points on the contract curve is this point. This point gives Smith everything that the economy has. Smith gets all the apples and all the, uh, and all the bananas. Jones gets no apples and no oranges. That's on the contract curve. That's Pareto efficient. It's horribly unfair. But all the five apples are going to somebody. They're not, none of the apples are getting wasted. All the bananas are going to somebody. None of the bananas are getting wasted. So uh, now that's not a, uh, uh, that doesn't fully characterize uh, optimality, but it's an indication it's one reason why that's a pretty optimal point. A stronger argument is that there's no way to make Jones, who has nothing, better off without taking something from Smith. And since there's no way to make Jones better off without making Smith worse off, you're at a Pareto efficient point. So Pareto efficient points don't mean fairness. In fact, they they don't mean optimality in any kind of social sense. Indeed, let's suppose that the at the middle point of the box, of this Edgeworth box, where each one gets two and a half apples and two bananas. Let's suppose that point is, let's say, uh, here. Where, let's see, where should I put it? Maybe it's here. So suppose that's the midpoint. Many people would say that's the fair point. That's where every, each one gets half and half. Now, the way I've drawn it, it's not on the contract curve. And that can happen, depending on the preferences, depending on the way the indifference curves work. The midpoint might actually not be on the contract curve. So an economist would say the midpoint is not efficient. It's not optimal. Whereas the point in the upper right is efficient, and it is optimal. And as a, using the technical terms, that's a true statement. But that certainly should not be interpreted as saying that in any kind of policy sense, the midpoint is bad and the point of the upper right is good. An economist can, s can still say the midpoint is not optimal and the point in the upper right is optimal and say, I don't want to live in a society that's in the upper right. I want to live in a society that has the midpoint. Because again, the word optimal doesn't mean good. The word optimal, although it does mean good in everyday language, but in, in the language of economists, the word optimal just means Pareto optimal. It, it just means this. It doesn't mean anything else. It's a, it's a term of art. It's a technical term. And it doesn't have... Um, 
mean, it has some welfare implications, but it doesn't have really strong welfare implications. You can't say that just because a point is optimal, you should prefer it over a point that isn't optimal. Now, true, if you're at this midpoint, because it's not on the contract curve, there's another point on the contract curve that would make both Smith and Jones happier. So if you can reach that point, you probably should. So in that sense, the midpoint isn't a good place to be. But lots of people would believe that the midpoint is a better place to be than the upper right, even though the upper right is efficient or optimal or Pareto optimal or Pareto efficient, and the middle point is not. So it's important to keep in mind the limitations of this notion of Pareto optimality. I'll close with one final example, which is easier. The example that you have on the screen has two commodities, apples and bananas. Suppose you just have one commodity, uh, apples. So suppose I'm trying to divide apples among 20 people in a classroom. The only non-Pareto optimal allocations are the ones where some of the apples just get thrown away. If you give all the apples to one person, that's Pareto efficient. If you give, if you divide the apples evenly among everybody, that's Pareto efficient. If you give all the apples to the people sitting on the left-hand side of the room and no apples to the people sitting on the right-hand side of the room, that's Pareto efficient. There are a whole bunch of Pareto efficient allocations, just like on the this, on this screen, the contract curve is really long. There are a whole bunch of allocations on the contract curve. So there are many, many Pareto efficient allocations in the example with dividing apples among students in a classroom. The only kind of allocations that are not Pareto efficient are where you throw some of the apples away. All right, so I think that concludes our discussion of Pareto efficiency. We are going to come back to the Edgeworth box in another kind of setting in the next video.